All right, moving on to chapter three. We're gonna talk about the movement of chemicals, light and heat in water. So first we're gonna talk about diffusion. Diffusion is the movement from a high concentration to a low concentration. So substances like nutrients, gases, contaminants, and heat will all diffuse through a liquid like water. Diffusion is influenced by the concentration gradient. So the higher the gradient from high to low, the faster diffusion will happen. It's influenced by advective transport, which is things like water currents, by temperature, by the size of the molecule. And I'll talk about how all of these things um, work. It's also influenced by the presence or structure of sediments or polymers, mucus, like bits of sand, you know, like stuff that's dissolved in the water, other stuff basically. Um, and then direct movement by organisms. Um, so for instance, this is Fick's law. Um, so two surfaces of different concentrations, um, concentration one and concentration two, um, you will see the rate of diffusion from the high concentration to the low concentration as described by what's called Fick's law. And it has to do with um, the distance between these two concentrations and the gradient, the difference between them. And so here is Fick's law, basically the flux, diffusion flux J is equal to D, which is some diffusion coefficient, okay, that um, changes depending on what system you're working in. And then the difference between the two concentrations divided by the difference between the two distances. And so we'll have an opportunity to work with this equation in workshop. Okay, so the rate of diffusion J is greatest, so the flux is greatest when there are large concentration gradients over small distances. Okay, so you can imagine how, um, how this rate of diffusion changes um, depending on distance and the gradient between them. So here is um, some pictures showing diffusion of a dye in a liquid, okay? So you can see how it's just moving naturally. Like you drop a dye drop in the water, it doesn't stay a drop, right? It diffuses and because of all of these factors, right? So many factors affect how fast diffusion happens. So the fluid identity, right? Some, something that's more viscous is going to slow down diffusion. If you dropped a dye into, a, um, you know, some, corn syrup, it wouldn't diffuse as fast as if you dropped it into water. Okay, so viscosity can slow down diffusion. The size of the diffusing molecules, a large molecule will move through that liquid slower than a small molecule. This is kind of one of the tenets of gel electrophoresis, right? That, that larger strands of DNA will move slower through the gel. Okay, so we're talking about um, electrically kind of charged diffusion there. Temperature, the diffusion will be slower in cold liquids if you heat it up. So have you ever tried to dissolve sugar in a cold glass of tea versus a hot glass of tea? Okay, so that's partly what's happening is that sugar will dissolve faster in warm water. And the pore size, so you're trying to look at diffusion like through the sediment or through sand, um, the pores will slow down diffusion and then um, the sediments will adhere to contaminants. This is how like, water filtration works. So a lot of filtration systems have the water moving through a layer of sand that kind of filters out all of the bad stuff. And then mixing, right? So if you stir your glass of tea, then diffusion is gonna happen faster. So stratification, where we have water that's stagnant or separated, will slow down rates of diffusion as well. And then of course, a solid object gets in the way and can slow down diffusion. So um, there's also a diffusion boundary layer. We talked about flow boundary layers, but there are also diffusion boundary layers around solid objects. So there are different types of diffusion. The first is just molecular diffusion, and it's caused by the thermal movement of the molecules, and we call this Brownian motion. It's like a random walk, okay? So molecules just kind of like, they just move around a little bit, and that's molecular diffusion. It's really important for small molecules and it increases with temperature. Um, but then there's transport diffusion and that is caused by water movements. Okay, so this is what's gonna be happening in flowing waters. Um, usually transport diffusion dominates over molecular diffusion just because you're getting bigger movements of things when the liquid is moving around. Um, but very close to the surface of objects, molecular diffusion might be most important, right? Because um, the 
because the slow has the flow has slowed down so much close to objects. So the biology of diffusion, um, diffusion is really important for organisms. They have to they have to get gases from the water into their bodies, so those gases have to diffuse across their membranes. Um, and so if you're a big organism, it's going to be harder for you to get gas to diffuse across your membrane and get into the inside of your body versus if you're a small organism. So the surface area to volume ratios of different organisms are really important. So um, large organisms have a harder time living in aquatic systems. They have slower metabolism. Um, and there are all kinds of adaptations to increase the surface area to volume to create more surfaces for diffusion to take place. So this is why gills look the way they do. Lots of little nooks and crannies for the gill to come into um, interaction with dissolved gases. So on a small scale, at low Reynolds numbers, turbulent mixing is unlikely and so molecular diffusion dominates. Um, but at larger scales, this is, you know, you can swim through the water really fast to promote um, the transfer of oxygen past your gills. Or caddisflies will kind of undulate inside their cases to move water past their gills um, and to increase those rates of diffusion. All right, so the movement of gas from the atmosphere into bodies of water, um, this is called re-aeration, this process of gas equilibrium with the atmosphere. Here, you know, you can see kind of fog on the surface of the water, kind of trying to get you a sense of, of what that might look like, right? So there's a modification of Fick's law, okay, where, where we have this flux, um, K is the reaeration coefficient, and the concentration of gas in the solution minus the concentration of gas in the atmosphere. So we can actually calculate the flux of a gas either from the water out into the atmosphere or from the atmosphere into the water using this modify, modification of fixed um, law. And we'll try that in workshop two. So note here, there's no X, right? There's no distance because the distance between the surface of the water and the atmosphere is minute or non-existent, right? So there's no, there's no difference in distance. All right, um, but estimating reaeration can be really difficult. Um, and it depends on things like the turbulence of the water, the temperature of the water, if there are any chemicals on the surface of the water, and on the properties of the gas. So things like CO2 will reaerate at different rates compared to things like methane or oxygen, other gases. So it's a really interesting area of study. Um, we often use some non-reactive tracer gas like argon or radon um, when we bubble it in the water to figure out how how quickly it moves from the water to the gas or backwards to figure out how something like CO2 might move. And ebullition is the loss of gas bubbles from an aquatic ecosystem. This is especially important for methane. Um, I mean, it's important for all gases, but a lot of people use gas bubbles trapped in ice to measure rates of methane flux from um, lakes up in the, the cold parts in the permafrost and things. 